All right. Welcome, everybody, to The Art of Transformation. I am very pleased to welcome our next guest, who I met on a coaching retreat almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. Mark McGinnis is an award-winning poet who has been coaching creative professionals since 1996, helping them with their creative, personal, and professional development. His poems appear in leading library magazines and his poetry podcast, A Mouthful of Air, which has been selected by Podcast Review as one of the top nine podcasts for poetry lovers in the past two years. It's huge. He has published four books of career guidance for creatives, including Productivity for Creative People and 21 Insights for 21st Century Creatives. His podcast for creatives is the 21st Century Creative. So welcome, Mark. How are you? Thank you, Mark. Very pleased to be talking to you today. It's really great to catch up again. Yeah. We met about a year ago in Santa Fe through our mutual friend, Coach Kelly. We did. And uh, something I wanted to ask you when I was reading your bio. So you've been coaching creatives since 1996. Yeah. So what you, you started coaching when you were, what, 12 years old? How old? <laughs> when did you get started? Uh, no, I was a little older than that. So I was, I started out as a psychotherapist in the 90s. And that was in my twenties. We're not, we're, even in the UK, we're not allowed to practice in our teens, psychotherapy. And uh, I ended up with, you know, the usual range of clientele that you would expect in a therapy practice. I was particularly intrigued by the actors, the novelists, the agency creatives, designers, filmmakers, entrepreneurs. There was a particular energy about those sessions. And after a while, I thought, you know, well, well, these people, not all of these people have necessarily got a mental health problem, but they are creative. They work with their heart and soul. So maybe we, you know, I, I put a, I have a door called coaching to invite these people through rather mm. than therapy. And you can imagine in the nineties, it was a lot harder than it is now to explain what a creative coach did or does. My introduction, if you will, to the world of coaching was in the early 2000s yes. and it's been around for a lot longer, but, uh, it felt a lot kind of like the wild west and it's still true. Anybody could sort of do it and you were, didn't really know what you were getting or how to do it or anything. It, it's curious. I mean, there was a transformation for you at that point. So, so how did you go through that process of transforming or transitioning from where you were to the work you do as a coach? To begin with, I made it up as I went along. I mean, I just literally in the place I was working in the West End of London, I was like, just put some coaching leaflets next to the therapy leaflets and see who showed up and then work with them on that basis. Mm -hmm. Then I did things like running workshops to get the word out and meet new people. Two years after that, I got involved in a business coaching consultancy, doing executive coaching and training large corporate organizations, which was really kind of eye-opening in terms of working in a business context, working with teams, working with leaders, seeing the impact that the work could have in a larger context than just one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And that was great, but it was never quite the right fit for me. You know, in my heart of hearts, I'm a poet. And that's why I love to coach creatives. Mm. And so I mm. always felt that work was calling me. And for a long time, it was kind of alongside the other things I was doing. I the think, poetry was alongside or the coaching well, was alongside? Poetry has always been alongside. Poetry is alongside. That, that's how poetry works in the world. <laughs> but the creative coaching and the therapy and the corporate coaching were alongside for a while. And then I went back to college and did a master's in creative and media enterprises, which gave me the big picture of the creative economy, the whole context that my clients were operating in. That was another important part of the jigsaw. You took some time to experiment with the process of coaching within your existing practices. And then is it fair to say that once you discovered that spark, that, that love of that process and what it could create, you found education and other tools to add to your expertise, to your skill set. Yes. And also like all coaches, I had a series of coaches and mentors myself, John Eaton, Roy Johnson were the two 
older coaches who I work with in the corporate context. Later on, like you, I work with Peleg Top. I also had help and advice from Rich Litvin, Steve Chandler. I've had a long-term poetry mentor for many years, Mimi Calvarti. Mm. You know, just about everything that I've done, I've looked for who is there, who is kind of world-class at this thing that I want to be good at, and how can I get in the room with them? How can I learn from them? Mm. And then I've ended up with this quite eclectic mix of different skills and experiences. I, I, I resonate with that quite deeply. I mean, in my art career and my coaching career, I can list the mentors and, and experts who have influenced me, but also to whom I have reached out and said, maybe in as many words, I would like to learn from you. You know, how do I do that? Do you, is there a class? Is there a course? Is there a one-on-one -on -one opportunity? Do, do you feel, I mean, you work with a lot of different creatives. Is this something that, that you see as necessary on the creative journey to mastery? Yeah. I mean, so much of it is modeling other people's success, which isn't the same as copying, but it's looking at what do they do? What can I learn from their example? And what would my version of that look like? I mean, sometimes as practice, it's not a bad thing to do to copy the work of a great master. And inevitably you end mm -hmm. up doing it your own way at some point. You know, one of my favorite poets, Chaucer, yeah. he said he called himself a translator for quite a long time. He would be translating French and Italian texts. Mm. Except his versions of it ended up sounding nothing like the original. He would translate a sonnet <laughs> instead of 40. By the time he'd finished with the 14 lines of the sonnet, it was 21 lines long because he discovered several other things that he wanted to say in the process. So, and I mean, that's maybe an extreme example, but I think we all, we can learn by imitation. And, and at a certain point, we're not imitating. We're, we're going our way and, and doing our own version of it. Yes. Something I used to, tell my students who are learning to draw or create images was that there's a process through which we, you know, generate the process to our own style, if you will, is imitation, emulation, and then innovation. Oh, that's nice. I'm like, <laughs> borrow that, Sounds Mark, if, it, if it's all the same with you. You, you. you can steal it. You can Brilliant. steal it. Yeah. Brilliant. You know, the other thing that I heard from, I, do, are you familiar with the, the Hellboy character? I'm slightly, um, I vaguely know who it is. There's been movies and it's an extremely popular comic book franchise. I had yeah. the good fortune of having a few conversations with Mike Mignola, who invented and, and drew Hellboy. And, yeah. and I believe it was he who told me that style is really just a sum up of, it's sort of, you figure out all the things that you're unable to do by trying to do them and whatever's left, that's you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. What I like to ask my guests on this podcast is, you know, you are deep in the work of transformation as a coach, as a creative, what is something that you think someone listening to this podcast could make use of, take away from this podcast to help in their journey uh, of transformation or of creation and design of their next chapter in life? So as I understand it, Mark, you know, the, the people who listen to this show are like, like you and me there. They are ambitious for, to do something creative, to do something remarkable, to do something meaningful in their life. And mm -hmm. this is something that's been coming up quite a lot in coaching sessions over the last few months. But usually I find my articles and ideas, they tend to come from memes that keep coming up, things that I keep saying in coaching sessions that seem to resonate mm -hmm. with more and more clients. And if there's a Darwinian thing that the, the ones that, you know, last the longest <laughs> end up as articles or podcasts or something like that. And so this is an idea that I was talking to you about the other day, which is, you know, one question yeah. I asked my clients a lot recently is, are you in the ballpark? And this comes up yeah, a lot. What, is, what does that mean? How do, when, when does that come up? Well, it comes up when somebody is putting themselves forward for a big opportunity maybe pitching for a big business opportunity, entering a competition, trying to get their work in an exhibition mm -hmm. or a magazine, or to get their book published, or to get their movie made, or to get funding from investors, mm -hmm. or they're applying mm -hmm. for a senior job. And quite often I'm talking to somebody who gets really close 
to an opportunity. You know, they get told, oh, you were down to the last three or the last two, or you made the short list, or yeah, we really like this. The travelers, we've just done something similar or the markets just change or whatever. And there's a sense that you're getting really close, but without actually getting there. And it can be really mm -hmm. frustrating, particularly if it keeps happening, you know? And at a certain point, I mean, we're only human and, and most creatives, we have a fairly active inner critic. And so there's a certain point where you <laughs> think, well, am I just kidding myself? I just keep, you know, it's never me. And to me, this is where I divide this idea of the ballpark. So as I understand it, a ballpark is in American sports. I think it's baseball, isn't it? It's the field of play, right? Ba baseball would be the version of sports ball that you are talking sports about. Sports ball, yes. that's right. Yes. And it's a sports ball sport. It's a sports yes. ball thing. But it's America, as, as I understand it, it came from America. But we have, we, never, we don't call yes. playing fields yeah. ballparks, but we do have that phrase in the UK and I was researching it. And so the idea is that it got, it came to mean, are you in the right kind of area? And are you at the right kind of level of performance? Or, you know, if you're bidding for something at auction, is your, is your bid in the right, at the right kind of level to be considered? And so it's become, mm. this phrase has become, well, if you're in the ballpark, then you're kind of playing at the right kind of level. Mm. And if we go with the sports metaphor for a bit, you know, I have this theory that it's harder to get on the ballpark than it is to win a game once you're on the ballpark. So, you know, we, mm -hmm. you know, if anybody follows a sports team, as I do for my sins, you know, there's a lot of suffering can go into that, that you watch games and you lose. What's, what's your team? My what's team the team that's your... the football club up in Scotland. And, you know, we had a crushing defeat last week. We lost to Atletico Madrid 6-0 after a rather contentious refereeing decision. And, you know, sometimes you say, well, <laughs> really, is it worth it? But actually to get on that pitch, to get on that field of play yeah. is, I think is harder to get on from, you know, from being the guy in the stand like me or on the sofa watching the game to being the player on the pitch well, certainly. is harder than it is to watch you on the pitch to actually win a game. Now you could go yes. on a losing streak. You could, you know, week after week you turn up and, and you feel you're getting defeated. But if you hang in there, if you stay on that part, you've always got the chance to win. So what I end up saying to clients is, are you, do you have evidence that you are in the ballpark? You know, if somebody says something. Well, just to, to pause you for a second, because yeah. you, you mentioned something, you mentioned two things that are connected for me, you, the inner critic mm -hmm. and the guy on the couch. Right. We all know that person who's yelling at the TV and saying, oh, come on, like you should. And, that, and I feel like that's, that's really, that's the inner critic. You know, the voice in the back of your head that's on the couch telling you, you should have done it differently. When meanwhile, meanwhile, you're playing at this high level, you're in the room with the potential investors, right. you've made it to the final list of nominations. And there's some dude on a couch telling you how he would have done it. Yeah. Yeah. Like the two guys in the Muppet show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Waldorf and Stadler, some of my favorites. Right, yeah, absolutely. Right. And, and nothing's ever good enough, is it? But the thing is, you can't listen to that no, person. No. You've got to listen to, well, your coach, if you have one, you, or you've got to listen to the part of you that knows what it took to get there. And so if you are in, because you, there's all kinds of reasons why you might not get the job or you might not get the deal or you might not win the competition or whatever right. it is that actually don't have all that much to do with your quality of your work. You know, it's easy for us to think if I didn't win, if I didn't get it, that means my work wasn't good enough. That means I'm not good enough. But very often quality is the, the minimum requirement to get on that ballpark. You've also got to take into yeah. account, you know, the whole context, what that studio may have just commissioned, the way um, the market's going, it could be simply that they just, it, and I've done this when I was a magazine editor, I remember replying to some poets and saying, look, this work is really good. It's good enough to be in the magazine. It's just not really my taste. So you may well have better luck with mm. another editor. And yeah. I think, you know, at some yeah. point somebody has to really like your work and, you know, there's, you go on Netflix, you go on Amazon, there's a whole world of 
good work out there, but we don't necessarily like it all. No, that's true. Thank and you. I think t- taste is such a, that's a whole, that's a very rich topic because mm-hmm. we obviously, we have our own taste, yeah. which is why we're doing anything. Yeah. And to, you know, then sort of put it up for essentially evaluation by somebody else, it can feel very personal, very crushing. And so when you're talking about these people who make it to the room, but then don't get the thing, there, there is a difficulty to get through in that evaluation. Yeah. And this is where we've got to learn to be our own best critics, if you like. We've got to learn <laughs> to look for those clues that let us know, actually, do I have evidence that I am? And so if you're not getting anywhere near, then maybe it's time to go and work with a teacher of some kind and learn to be better. But if you're getting the feedback, mm-hmm. actually, you were close, you were worthy of consideration. You made it to the last round, whatever that may be. That's a strong indicator. So any feedback that you get from the gatekeeper is one thing to look at. Another thing to look at is the numbers. If you've got any idea, for instance, how many people applied to the job and you know that you got down to the last five, mm-hmm. so there's a hundred people applied, you got down to the last five. That's a big achievement in itself. That's showing that you are in the ballpark. So yeah. if you get down to the last two or three. Another thing to look out for is if they ask you to submit again, you know, there's quite often mm. this happens in the poetry magazine world, it's called it a tiered rejection. If you get that, so there's the standard rejection, you know, we wish you luck with your work elsewhere. <laughs> You're perfect. Okay. It's like, we're not expecting to hear from you again. <laughs> But if you get a personal note from the editor that says something like, I enjoyed the, sorry, I couldn't have room. I look forward to seeing more of your work. That's a really good sign. You've got to send yes. stuff in again. Or, you know, yeah, if you apply for some public funding, maybe, and you get the feedback, mm, the application wasn't quite right. But if you can adjust these things, then maybe there might be a future opportunity. Any, because any gatekeeper is overwhelmed. You know, there are so many people, yeah. if the opportunity is worthwhile, there is so many people who want that opportunity. And so if they give you any hint of you're welcome to contact me again, or do submit again, or I like the work, look forward to seeing more of it. They're not going to say that just to be nice. Cause what that means is if they're just being nice, it means they're inviting more mediocrity into their inbox. They will only right, say and they, that. And they don't have time. Now, they don't have time to, to do that. You've been in this position. I've been in this position. I would not want to invite that. I, I, I really only want to see, I already have a hard enough decision if I'm sitting on that side of the table yeah. with all of the great stuff that's coming in. I don't need to encourage necessarily, you know, more. And plus, as you said, these gatekeepers are, you know, and, and I use that term in a non-negative, I mean, they're, they're yeah, keeping just a, a, neutral a, a yeah. quality on their product. They're taking good and, care of that uh, gate. Yeah, and, and the product behind it. And if they're overwhelmed, they certainly don't have time to write a nice personal note to every single yeah. person. I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, thinking on the, you know, on the visual arts side, submitting to galleries or magazines or, or companies to do work for their products. To have an art director who's getting hundreds, if not thousands of submissions to, to sort through, to get a personal note like that. Yeah. I mean, you're more than in the room. You're ready. And when the opportunity is right, if you keep showing up, yeah. that will turn into something eventually. And I can tell you many stories about that. But I wanted to ask you, because in this conversation, when we were talking around the talking about the ballpark, we also talked about something that you call the triangle consolation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So this is another kind of lens for looking at rejection. If you, so the idea is that we tend to focus on quality because that's the thing that's most in our control. And it's also the thing that's most attached to our ego. You know, am, can I really do this? Am I any good? Am I kidding myself? And right. if the rejection comes in, then the, the natural instinct to think, oh, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough. Oh, I'll never be good enough. You know, it, it can be a short step from, from one to the other. With the triangle yeah. of consolation, what I'm trying to do is get a client or myself, depending on, you know, who's in the hot seat this week with the rejection to look at the bigger picture. And so the idea is that the, the triangle at the top, it's about quality, but there's two other points of the triangle. So one of them is context and the other one is taste. Mm-hmm. And so taste, we just mm. talked about, which is maybe they like it. Maybe they don't, you know, it's like 
trying to argue with your kids about what you should try that. You might like it. They try it. I don't like it. You can't persuade somebody. I mean, your kids are usually just wrong, but we can move. We can just see the, the analogy for what it is. That I appreciate aside. it. <laughs> All the parents will relate. Um, you can't persuade somebody that they like, I don't know, horror, if they really think that they don't, or romance, or heavy metal, and context. or whatever it is. And so that there's always that element of personal taste. Then context is about what is going on in the bigger picture. You know, for instance, if there is a theme for a competition or a magazine, I will much more likely to enter that if I have got poems that fit that theme because, you know, that they've narrowed the field by saying that, you know, poems have to be about, I don't know, transport or travel, you know, football, sports ball. Well, that's a nice context to be a part of. I, I've found this, tell me what you think. That, you know, sometimes you have a theme or you have a sense of what that publication or gallery or whatever is kind of looking for because you can see what they're doing. But I found that there's many instances where you discover the theme when you see who they've selected sometimes. You know, you can look at who's made the cut and say, oh, now I can see kind of what it is that they were looking for. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, but I think this is an argument for us doing our homework. Really, I mean, if we're sending stuff to a magazine, we shouldn't have some idea about what that magazine is about. And now you know, if we're sending frozen. stuff to a gallery, we should definitely have known you... what the gallery is known for. If you're entering a competition, I mean, there's one thing I will often do is just who's judging the competition? Is it a poet whose work resonates with me? If they are, then I'm much more likely to enter that competition. And, and it's not foolproof, but we can't control everything. You can't control somebody's taste, but you can control who you send it to. If you know somebody is known for a certain kind of work or that publication or that studio is known to produce a certain kind right. of work, then pitch to them. And yes, you can't predict everything in advance. Sometimes you look at it and you go, oh, I was completely wrong about what I thought they were looking for. And also, I want to be really clear here. I am not talking about creating work the market. You're not trying to write something or d design something or produce something in order to please somebody else. This is about once you have some work. That's a great distinction. You know, once you have some pieces to play with, if you like, just think, well, where should I best send these? You know, so if I'm sending to magazines, there will be some editors I might, you know, I'll look at my list of poems. Mm -hmm. I might think, okay, well, these ones probably mm -hmm. more likely to, to be a better fit over here. And these ones over there. Yeah, exactly. I, I can think of, it makes me immediately think of someone who's actually a part of my group coaching program right mm -hmm. now, but, and I'll keep it anonymous, but if he hears this, he's not going to know exactly who I'm talking about, but he was in the, he was taking courses with the mentorship program that I was a part of for a little over a decade. Yeah. And he was creating work. And I think he'll, he would tell you this, but he was creating work that the, the, the folks in the school kind of didn't understand. It wasn't like what other people were doing. Yeah. And instead of beating himself up and trying to create something that would fit what everyone else was going for, he essentially did a wonderful job of finding his own audience, really yeah. going out to events and on the internet and saying, this is what I do. This is what feels really good. I believe in it. Where are my people? And that, you know, that's a, that can be a very long road. He's managed to walk that road and, and, and now, you know, he does very well going to events and selling his work online. And, you know, he's made these cards that therapists are using. He's really taken it very far. But this is all from a place where he was in a room full of people saying, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, good for him. I mean, it's a brave thing to do, but actually from one point of view, it's the only thing to do. You can't compromise and just start to produce work that you think will please and that will help you fit in. You've got to go out and find the people who are going to love it and have some faith that they will. And also that example, you know, it really opens up the whole other context, which is don't spend your whole career just applying for opportunities where people can say yay or nay, because that gives all the power to someone else. Look for ways that you can create your own platform, your own audience, your own network your own support yeah. network. So it, in the poetry world, for instance, it's fairly traditional. You know, you send work off to magazines and publishers and competitions and whatever. And that's a great 
system in lots of ways. It's an ecosystem that has supported a lot of great work. And so I'm quite happy to play along and enjoy that game. And I also have a podcast. And the podcast is my space where I mm. invite poets on. Mm. And I read poems. I talk about them. I interview other poets. And that's my direct channel to speak to the people who are interested in my work. And it really helps, I think, to have something like that, you know, something, your own initiative, where you're creating, you're attracting, and you're connecting directly with people that isn't dependent on gatekeepers, judges, yeah. um, editors, producers, and so on. Wonderful as these people are, you know, and I don't, I really don't want to be doing a downer on that because it is a, in lots of ways, it's a thankless task because you, you literally can't keep everyone happy and it's a lot of work. And, a lot of responsibility. So I do think we should champion them as well, but also champion Agreed. yourself Agreed. And, and do what your friend suggested and, and follow through on, which is go and find your tribe. I, I think that's a beautiful note to start to close on. There's so much here that I'd love to have you back at some point, because I'm going to go through the notes and I feel like there's five other podcasts in this podcast, but I want to thank you so much for joining today. And Take a second, please tell us and, and the listeners, where can they find you? Where can they find your work? What's the best place that, that you'd like to send people? And of course, I'll put this in the show notes as well. Okay. Well, if you are one of the, the people who are interested in the poetry, you will find that at markmcginnis.com and on my podcast, Mouthful of Air, where I share poems and poets. And also you get a bit of the context of the poem as well. It's not just you get the poem and you've got, that's it, good luck with it. But you know, I'll read a poem and then I'll, I will enthuse and talk about why I love it and why I think you should too. On the coaching side, lateralaction.com is my coaching site. If you go there, you will find my books for creatives. You will also find my podcast, 21st Century Creative, and also details of my coaching service. So I work with experienced creative professionals who really want to work on themselves and step things up for the next phase of their career. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Mark. It's been fantastic to reconnect with you and to stay connected with you since we met earlier this year. Thank you, you Mark. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's been great to reconnect from the other side of the whale road. And thank you for being the best kind of gatekeeper today by inviting me on the show and hopefully <laughs> sharing some ideas that will be helpful to people around the world. And I really am a huge fan of what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. I think that's a great note to close on. Thanks everybody for listening. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.